Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everybody. Thank you, everybody, for joining us today. My name is Joe Sweet, and we are privileged to have a global audience from over 55 countries and, and 400 registrants. So thank you for joining us. And we're excited to be connecting with all of you for Cleveland Clinic's second episode of our Global Connect webinar series. Thank you to our returning viewers and welcome to those of you who are tuning into this series for the first time. Today, our featured Cleveland Clinic experts will be Dr. Sanjay Mukhopadhyay, Director of Lung Pathology, Pathology and Laboratory Medicine Institute, and Dr. Atul Mehta, Senior Staff Physician and Gwencore Family Endowed Chair in Lung Transplantation Respiratory Institute at Cleveland Clinic, who will be interviewed by Dr. Curtis Rimmerman, Chairman of International Operations at Cleveland Clinic. Dr. Rimmerman, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Uh, thanks very much, Joe. It's Cleveland Clinic's and International Operations uh, privilege to put on this Global Connect webinar series. This is in collaboration with our Global Leadership and Learning Institute and also our Center for International Medical Education and also our Global Patient Services. This is a series that is meant to educate colleagues around the world as we fight this terrible pandemic. We're learning a lot here at Cleveland Clinic and it's our obligation to share what we learn in a very timely manner. I don't wanna delay the rest of the presentations and uh, our subject matter experts. We do encourage questions. We have some questions embedded in the uh, presentation which we think are salient. However, if you do have questions, we'll either try to address those during the presentation or offline. Without delay, let me turn it over to my uh, friend and colleague, Dr. Atul Mehta. Thank you very much, Gert. Good morning, Sanjay. Joseph, thank you for the kind remarks. In the next session, I'm going to talk about a clinician's perspective on COVID-19. COVID-19 is addressed by different terminology and hence for the clinician, I would like to point out that COVID-19 stands for Coronavirus Disease 2019. It is also referred as SARS-CoV-2, which stands for Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome Coronavirus 2. All of you know that it is an RNA virus which affects mammals and birds. In the center of the slide, you see artist's rendition on the coronavirus, and those red triangles are extremely important. They are referred as spike proteins, which are essential to understand the pathogenesis of the disease, as well as for the researchers to come up with vaccination against coronavirus. It's understandable that the term corona comes from the corona around the sun, the halo around the sun, which is referred as corona. And this spike particles make corona around the viral particle, which is seen on the right side of the slide, which is an electron microscope picture of the coronavirus. And you can very clearly see the spike proteins on this viral uh, particle. Next slide, Joe. Uh, let me give you my clinic clinician's perspective on this particular disease. For the last three months, I have been following it very closely. And that is our our understanding continues to evolve and requires daily updates on this particular disease. Fortunately, most cases are mild and include flu-like symptoms such as fever, cough, shortness of breath, pink eye, etc., etc. The incubation period for this disease is about five days and mortality appears to be between one to four percent most severe cases are seen in individuals about the age of 60 years. As the number of asymptomatic cases are better understood, mortality rate is likely to decrease. And I do not want to forget in this era of pandemic for COVID-19, other respiratory infections continue to circulate such as influenza, community acquired pneumonia, RSV infection, and so on and so forth. Next slide, please. Now the main question is how this disease is different than common flu or influenza. And I would like to point out that this particular condition or this particular virus is highly contagious. It is highly virulent. 
There is a great predilection for the lungs and pulmonologists hence need to get involved with this particular condition. It leads to respiratory failure, shock, cardiac arrhythmias, myocarditis, ARDS or SARS-like symptoms or presentation and hypercoagulability status. There are so many other presentations such as neurological involvement, renal failure, so on and so forth. Kurt? Yes, thank you so much, Atul. So as we look at the data that has been published about how COVID affects the lungs, has this given you a better understanding of this disease? Uh, certainly, uh, there are, there are uh, some um, uh, data, there is some literature related to um, uh, the pathogenesis of this particular disease. Joe, may I have the next slide, please? Um, and it is, it is very interesting in that regard. More we learn about it, more we realize that there are major gaps in our understanding related to COVID-19. And whatever information we have, however, it could be divided into certain stages. Stage one, stage two, stage three. The first stage, which is like first couple days after inoculation, that is basically binding of the spike proteins, as I mentioned to you, to the ACE receptor site on the surface of the ciliary cells of human beings. Um, uh, can we go back to the previous slide? Yes. And what happens is this viral particles are attached to the ACE receptors. Now, let me pause here for a second to reassure all the individuals who are taking medications like ACE inhibitors or ACE receptor blockers, they need not worry about um, that this, their medications do not interfere with um, either the diagnosis or severity of the disease. And it is safe to continue taking these medications during the uh, COVID era. And this is uh, supported by two very recent articles in the publication, one coming out from the Cleveland Clinic in JAMA Cardiology just last night. Once these particles are attached to the ACE receptors, then they enter the cells that is proteolysis, which leads to production of um, uh, replicase, and this replicase help produce more viral particles. These viral particles in stage two cause immune reaction, leading to release of beta and delta interferon, and which eventually leads to cytokine release and further destruction into the lung. Yes. The stage three of the disease is also very and interesting in the that. sense that these viral particles have predilection for the peripheral pneumocytes as well as subpleural pneumocytes, type two pneumocytes leading to apoptosis and their uh, diffuse alveolar damage and ARDS like picture. And again, it is related to the cytokine release. And that is what we have understanding yet there is uh, tremendous gaps in our understanding related to this disease. Next slide, Joe. Dr. Mehta, if I could interrupt you one second, we're going to, we're having a, a tech issue and I'm going to try to sure. uh, see if I could get the slides to be a little clearer. So. Apologize to our attendees, yes. slight technical issue. <laughs> Kurt, was that, uh, do you have any question related to the last answer? No, I think it was uh, perfectly clear as a cardiologist that concerned me as well when I first was learning about this disease, but uh, things have been more clear and much more reassuring. And you always ha have to look at the risk benefit of some of these essential medicines for conditions outside the lungs as well, uh, a tool. Yeah, but it is extremely safe. And both the studies I referred to had more than thousand patients. So it is absolutely safe to take ACE inhibitors as well as ACE receptor blockers. Let me move on uh, to our presentation. You know, as I mentioned to you earlier, that is a highly contagious disease or highly contagious virus. And I want to give you some historical data here. And all of us are uh, familiar with SARS-1 or COV-1 uh, that occurred in year 2002. And it took eight months for this particular virus to infect 8,000 individual. It led to about 775 deaths with the case fatality ratio about 9.5%. And of course it originated in China as well. Then we go to the MERS virus in 2012 in Middle East. It took it 12 months to infect 2,500 individuals, about 850 deaths with the uh, case fatality ratio of about 29%. 
when we talk about a COVID-19, in 15, first 15 weeks, it infected 2 million individuals, 200,000 deaths, with the case fatality ratio about 2 to 5%. So that is the, it is highly contagious virus, and we need to, uh, we need to be concerned about that, and we need to take proper precautions. Next slide, please. Um, again, briefly talking about the epidemiology, as you know, this picture's on the right side of the slide. It does not spare Prince or the Prime Minister. Uh, overall today, I think over close to 4 million individuals have been infected with this virus, at least in the United States itself. As of this morning, 74,000 deaths have taken place. Uh, unfortunately, it is Spain which is affected the most, which has got 5,311 cases per million population with about 511 deaths per million population. And this is the epidemiology related to the disease. Next slide, please. Um, symptoms, all of us know about it. Majority of the patients will have fever, as many as 90% more in adults than in children. Similar cough is present in over 63% of the adults. Dyspnea, myalgia, productive cough or sputum production, sore throat, headache, diarrhea are also other presenting symptoms of this particular condition. Next slide, please. Joseph? Yes. Yes. The other observation, these are interesting observations. Anosmia, loss of uh, smell, uh, dysgeusia, that is impaired sense of taste, conjunctivitis, profound fatigue, myalgia or arthralgia, even though they are not nearly as bad as the flu, GI symptoms for the first couple of days with two to three loose bowel movements per day, profound anorexia has been described, illness interestingly has a biphasic, biphasic presentation, for the first one to five days, they have some minor constitutional symptoms. Then there is a lull for about another next five days. And after 10 days, there is a turning point. Either the patient gets completely better or becomes severely ill, needing to go to the hospital for further management. The deterioration could be very rapid. It is claimed by the recent New England Journal article that they tolerate hypoxemia well. I'm not so sure about it. Maybe that represents virus involving the heart or the sinus node that the patient cannot generate enough heart rate to respond to their hypoxemia. Next slide, please. Uh, further perspective from a clinical standpoint, uh, from the early, in fact, early information from China where COVID, uh, where COVID was started, it showed that some individuals are at higher risk of getting sick from this illness, which includes individuals above the age of 65, those with the chronic medical conditions such as heart diseases, 17% of their patient had high blood pressure, other 5% had other cardiac conditions, 8% of the individuals having diabetes, and 2% of the individuals having lung diseases. Next slide, please. A rate of hospitalization for COVID-19 increases with age as it is shown here. Majority of the patients admitted to the hospital are about the age of 50 years. As you can see in this particular slide, that majority of the hospitalization, this is from MMWR data recently published uh, on the CDC government site. And as you see, majority of the hospitalizations are after the age of 50, while if you're below the age of 50, the chances of you requiring hospitalization is very small. And therefore, elderly individuals take extra precautions to stay healthy. Next slide, please. Uh, as a clinician, I would like to point out a few things which are extremely important in our day-to-day -day practice. What I want to do is differentiate or uh, between what is a droplet infection versus what is an airborne infection. COVID-19 spreads by droplet infection. These are the small wet particles that stay in the air uh, for a short period of time after individual coughs or sneezes and the contamination usually occurs in the presence of the host. The individual who is coughing and sneezing is infecting individual who is in the close proximity of him and he is infected. This is a droplet infection, especially for my uh, listeners from uh, India. Tuberculosis is an airborne infection. Any disease that is caused by pathogens that can be transmitted through the air 
uh, or the environment over the period of time uh, by small particles. And this information is extremely important. Next slide, please. To understand why we use certain types of masks. A surgical mask shown in figure A, it is a loose fitting disposable physical barrier between the mouth and the nose of the wearer and potential contaminants, contaminants in the immediate environment. Let me point out, it is not designed to protect the wearer from inhaling bacteria or viruses. It is only to protect the patients from the droplets coming out from the wearer of the mask. If you really want to protect yourself from the infection viruses or bacteria or even airborne infection, then you need to wear N95 mask. What is an N95 mask? It is a face piece that filters at least 95% of the airborne particles, which are larger than three microns in size, and it provides protection against particulates, but not against the gas gases and vapors. So if there is a chemical explosion, N95 mask is not going to be beneficial. Many of us, I would say majority of us today are wearing the cloth mask, which has got no standardization, there is no regulation. There is a little research related to the guidance of their effectiveness. It is only reason we wear the cloth mask is it is a last resort due to shortage of surgical masks and respirators. In India, they have been using this mask, especially the Hindu monks were wearing this mask for 3000 years. Next slide, please. Individuals who cannot be properly fitted with N95 mask and are involved in aerosol generating procedures such as bronchoscopy, they should wear powered air purified respirator as I'm showing you one of my nurses wearing it before starting the bronchoscopy procedure. On the left side of the slide, there is another form of an N95 mask which is shown by an arrow. Next slide, please. Also, this is a beautiful chart. I like it very much. Who should wear what type of personal protective equipment? And let's just look at the last two lines um, of this particular chart, that if you are involved in aerosol generating procedures, or you are performing code on this individual, you are doing CPR in this individual, then you must wear an N95 mask. Otherwise, wearing surgical mask is appropriate. And in the ambulatory setting, in the inpatient setting, or if you are just collecting nasopharyngeal swabs, wearing surgical mask, eye protection, gloves, and gown is appropriate. In ambulatory setting, there is no need to wear even gown. This is just to uh, you know, save personal protective equipment for future use. Next slide, please. Uh, once again, continuing with my perspective on this disease, the danger of the disease starts when the virus reaches the lungs. The progression from mild to moderate to severe case occurs very quickly. One in seven develops difficulty in breathing and other severe complications. They typ typically suffer with respiratory failure and other, vi other vital symptoms and sometimes develop septic shock. Next slide, please. So it is a very rapidly progressing disease. Kurt? So Atul, what respiratory conditions besides ARDS can be seen with COVID and what symptoms should patients look out for? Okay, uh, next slide, please. Um, Kurt, yeah, I'm glad you asked me this question because we see hundreds of CT scans on daily basis. And besides just the ground glass nodular appearance associated with COVID-19, you can also see solid infiltrates or consolidation as shown in frame A. We can also see crazy paving pattern, which is seen in pulmonary alveolar proteinosis, which is shown in frame B and C, which is also seen with COVID. You can also see interstitial infiltrates. And in small number of patients, we have also noticed bilateral pleural effusion. And these are the other radiographic presentation of COVID-19. In terms of symptoms, Besides cough, acute exacerbation of asthma, as well as that of COPD, pleuritic chest pain related to pulmonary embolism, and hemoptysis related to pulmonary infarction have also been presented by the patients. Next slide, please. I hope I answered your question. No, perfect, thank you. Okay, uh, very quickly going through the chest X-ray findings of COVID-19. 
Uh, ground glass opacity is the most common for presentation. About 60% of the patients will have this abnormality. Majority of the patients have bilateral infiltrates, as it is shown in this particular slide. Unilateral infiltrate is seen in about 35% of the patients. And uh, there are uh, interstitial infiltrates are also frequently present. Next slide, please. And the, the CT scan also jives with that of the uh, chest X-ray findings. And once again, ground glass opacities, which are more often bilateral than unilateral interstitial infiltrates. And about 17% of the patients will have a CT scan presentation of ARDS. The slide shown on the left or the picture shown on the left patient is in early stage of developing ARDS from COVID-19. Next slide, please. Let's briefly talk about the diagnosis of COVID-19. The rapid diagnosis can be made by PCR or reverse transcription polymerase change reaction. It is, uh, you can perform this thing on the nasal swab or oropharyngeal swab as it is shown here in this particular picture. They prefer doing the nasal swab. Probably it has got more sensitivity as more ciliated epithelium is, see, is present in the nasal swab. Um, the results are available in few hours to two days. If you wish to get the faster results, antigen tests could also be done. However, there is false positivity rate of about 15% when you do antigenic tests. Negativity. Next slide, please. Um, antibody testing is, is still is a matter of research. I think out of about um, 35 some uh, applications in United States, only five or six antibody tests have been approved by FDA. And it is still in the research stage, as I mentioned to you, it is a blood test, it is a serology test. And only thing it does, it detects historic infection. It does not always confirm immunity towards COVID-19. Lot needs to be learned about this particular antibodies because these antibodies which are tested, they are not ex exactly neutralizing antibodies. Of course, they are IgM and IgG antibodies and they appear within the system in majority of the patients between 17 to 28 days. As shown in the middle picture here on the right, it's a positive test. You see IgM as well as IgG bands, while the, the plate on the left, it's a negative antibody testing for COVID-19. Next slide, please. And uh, these are uh, very interesting pictures, uh, 41 patients undergoing antibody testing, just to show you that IgM antibodies, which is shown on the right side of the slide, is uh, IgM antibodies appear as early as within two days of infection, while IgG antibodies takes about 10 days to appear in the system. And in about 18 days, majority of the patients, almost 100% of the individuals will have IgG and IgM response present in their blood or serology. Next slide, please. Kurt? Yes. Is there anything you'd like to tell smokers out there? Obviously, smoking, I don't know if it has any uh, zero positive attributes, but is it particularly more serious in the setting of COVID-19? Um, absolutely. Um, and uh, I have two studies to refer to that. Uh, Joseph, may I have the next slide, please? Um, and as you can see here, very recently published data, some of it is actually in press, that it states that smokers are 1.4 times more likely to have severe symptoms and 2.4 times they are more likely to be admitted to intensive care unit, need mechanical ventilation, or even die as compared to non-smokers. And this particular study involved five other study. It was a meta-analysis, 1,359 patients were included in this particular study. A very recent the study, again, coming from China, five studies, total 1,400 some patients. It showed that odds ratio for progression towards severe disease uh, was 1.69 among smokers as compared to non-smokers, even though they claim that this was not statistically significant. There is some element that there is increased risk. If you smoke, you have more severe disease. I hope I answered your question. Yes, perfect, thank you. Next slide, please. Uh, how do you manage? Very quickly, let me take you through this. The management is mainly supportive. Let me point out once again that there is no scientific data for the use of 
hydroxychloroquine either for prophylaxis or for the management or the treatment of COVID-19. There is no scientific proof that this medication works. There are no double-blind randomized controlled trials to support the use of Plaquenil. On the other hand, occasionally, it, especially when used with azithromycin, it can cause QTC prolongation and patients who already have very sensitive myocardium, it can lead to very serious cardiac arrhythmias. So you have to be extremely careful. I recommend not using it. Uh, also, our infectious disease specialists and colleagues, they feel that um, lopinavir and ritonavir, they are not very useful for this particular virus. We'll briefly talk about remdesivir, which is also referred as Ebola drug. And let me point out that has not yet been approved for Ebola either. Another medication we routinely use in our hospitalized uh, COVID-19 patients is tocilizumab, which is interleukin-6 receptor antagonist. And this is mainly <coughs> to treat a cytokine release syndrome. And then uh, there is, of course, anecdotal reports of uh, passive antibodies, that is COVID convalescent plasma infusion. And there is a science behind that and could be used in selected patients. Next slide, please. I want to spend a few moments on uh, remdesivir intravenously because it has achieved or it has received uh, emergency use approval in the United States, referred as EUA. And that is based on a single NIH study, which involved about 1,000 patients. It was a randomized control plus uh, prospective trial in individuals who are hospitalized with severe disease. And this particular administ administration of this particular broad spectrum antiviral agent, it shortened the time to recovery from 15 to 11 days. And that difference was statistically significant. There was also a trend towards improvement in the survival of these patients who received the medications from 11.6% versus 8%. However, this difference was not statistically significant. I just want to point out this drug is not yet approved for SARS or MERS, and it was found ineffective against Ebola as well as Marbulan uh, viruses as well. Next slide, please. Well, treatments and vaccines are currently being tested for COVID. Do you have any advice for those of us who are on this webinar today from a personal and public health perspective, if you don't mind? Um, Kurt, this is, um, yes, it's a public health point, or it may be more philosophical question as well. Next slide, please. You know, uh, as I'm getting to an age, and I would, I, I would like to point out that pandemics are the part of our life, even in 2020. You won't believe I have lived through myself, TB, polio, HIV, SARS, MERS, Legionella disease, bird flu, swine flu, and now COVID-19. So even in 2020, if somebody feels that, oh, our science has advanced so much that we can take care of pandemics and epidemics, and that is not true. So be prepared for this type of illnesses for the rest of our life and continue to work towards that. And therefore, what we need to do is stay healthy, uh, quit smoking, take alcohol in moderation, good nutrition, exercise, avoid pollution. And I think that is some of the simplest way to keep ourselves health healthy. Make sure you are up to date with immunization. I'm talking about pneumonia vaccine and flu vaccine. Even today, many of us avoid taking flu vaccine and I don't think that now it is a wise thing to do. Washing hands, you know, for physicians, before you enter the patient's room and once you come out of the patient's room, I think this is a simple but a very good habit to prevent spread of infections. We should all learn um, social distance, distancing uh, in this particular time. And an individual I admire um, is the governor of New York State who just recently stated that not wearing a mask is disrespectful in the pandemics, during the pandemic. So I think these are some of the common things as, as a, an individual, as a citizen, we should do to avoid spread of the disease. I hope I answered your question. Sure, let me uh, tag on another question from the audience. Can you talk about our institution's PCR sensitivity and specificity? Uh, you're asking me? Yes, if you don't mind. The PCR, PCR is extremely sensitive in this regard. Uh, the sensitivity is about 85, close to 90%. Uh, if the test is negative, what my recommendation is that if you strongly suspect 
COVID-19 disease, and we have done it many times, is that patient has got bilateral ground glass appearance, patient has got features of uh, COVID-19 fever. Sometimes the fevers are very high, the patients have got rigors and chills, and you suspect COVID-19, if the test comes back negative, I would go back and repeat the test in a couple of days. And if it is negative, we have repeated one time, if four times the test because our clinical suspicion was very high, and fourth time the test came back positive. There are lots of things in this regard, you know, how the specimen is obtained, how the specimen is processed, how it is transported to the lab, what is the delay in doing so. Some of these things play a role in sensitivity of the PCR. So I trust PCR testing more than the antigen test. And one follow-up, you know, I know someone very well who had a recent uh, test for COVID-19 and they described it as an extremely invasive test through the nares into the posterior pharynx, I suppose. Um, so um, maybe it's related to testing technique as well. Uh, yes, absolutely. That is what I was referring to. If you just talk about the PCR testing, it is very sensitive, but there are lots of stages of, you know, when you obtain it, if it is not obtained properly. I mean, as you see, that's many a times are lines of 200 people waiting to get the swab test done and the individual who is doing it, it is not doing it properly. It is not a very painful test or anything like that. We do it routinely in my lung transplant clinic. Before even the pandemic, we were always looking for influenza. We are always looking for para-influenza or RSV infection. It's a very simple test, and uh, we seldom have false negatives in that regard. All right. Uh, go ahead, please. Uh, let me just very quickly go through, if the patient continues to get worse, of course, patient will require ventilatory support. Uh, but to point out to my critical care colleagues, uh, in some studies, prone positioning of the patients for ventilatory support has shown to reduce the shunt, improve the AAO2 gradient, and improve the uh, vital capacity as well as tidal volumes on these patients. This is not a simple proning the patient. There are protocols established by critical care societies. So please follow these protocols to prone the individuals if they are not improving with uh, regular ventilatory support. Next slide, please. And if patient continues to get worse, of course, they may require uh, support with ECMO. Uh, if patient has cardiac involvement, they are in heart failure, arrhythmias, ejection fraction has gone down, those patients will require AV or arteriovenous or veno-arterial ECMO. If the heart function is normal, patient could be managed by veno-venous ECMO. Occasionally, we add an arterial circuit to the veno-venous ECMO, that would be VVA ECMO. Let me just point out, in a very selected patients, very few patients, patients after COVID infection, if they develop interstitial infiltrates or interstitial disease, these patients have been treated with lung transplantation. There is some Chinese experience related to lung transplants in COVID patients. And at Henry Ford Hospital, if I'm not mistaken, there are a couple individuals in United States have undergone lung transplantation. Being a transplant physician, I had to bring it up, Kurt. Next, no problem. Next slide. Uh, so a tool from recovering COVID patients, will there be lasting uh, pulmonary effects or will they actually recover downstream from these issues? It's a, it's a very good question. The next slide, please. Um, you know, as I always say, Lord Byron had said actually that best profit of the future is the past. I mean, I don't have a crystal ball to tell you what will happen to the COVID-19 patients, but going back and looking at what happens to the ARDS patients three, four, five years down the line, and what happened to our SARS patient a few years down the line, and I found two beautiful articles related to that. One was related to ARDS uh, five years down the line from New England Journal of Medicine. Exercise limitation, physical and psychological impairment, decreased physical quality of life, increased cost and use of healthcare services are the legacies of uh, severe lung injury or ARDS. 100, 100 patients were included in this particular study. The another study is from China, involves 37 patients with SARS. Interestingly, majority of these patients recovered. DLCO of the SARS patient recovered uh, within three years after they were, they were discharged from the hospital 
in about 20 to 30 percent of the patients, there was mild to moderate restriction in the ventilatory defects and small airway dysfunction. However, the lung function of the most patients have recovered gradually, and there are about 37 patients. And that is their data on the six-minute walk distance on this patient shown on the left side. So if you do not develop ARDS, the likelihood of the completely recovering are very good. If you have ARDS, then you will have some impairment of the quality of life and increase uh, healthcare cost. Next slide, please. So further going on to the management, again, as I mentioned to you earlier, um, there is no specific treatment. Prevention is the best strategy. And uh, this is not the best time, Kurt, to take cruises, okay? Understood. The largest cruise ship in the world, and it is, you see, it's a closed space, large, individual, large number of people involved, very likely to be uh, fertile ground for COVID-19 viruses, okay? Long, long flights, air travels, use caution, frequent hand washing, I cannot overemphasize that. Avoid touch, teaching, touching your face and eyes with uncleansed ha hands. Avoid sick contacts, self-quarantine. Uh, we are still working on vaccination. I don't have much information because there is so much confusion about it at the present time. There are several companies working on making the vaccination, but it would take several months to do clinical trial to prove its effectiveness. Until that time, we'll have to use our common sense. Next slide, please. So as a physician in the COVID era, do you have any uh, lessons learned uh, as you think about taking care of your first patient compared to your most recent patient at all? Again, this is more of a, 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 a what you call psychological or philosophical question in that regard. And, and even though Sanjay is on the line, I would say this thing, you know, he's all into these biomarkers and stuff like that. For an old clinician like myself, I would say the best biomarker is the clinical acumen and vigilance. You know, that is there remain of the prime importance. Uh, travel history of any patient you see is extremely important. Once again, hand washing, hand washing, hand washing. Contact tracing, we need to do a little bit more than what we usually do to find out where the individual has been and whom he, he or she has been in contact with. And what I have learned more while dealing with the COVID patients that if you have a suspected case, you are taking proper care of the individual, but you can uh, prevent spread of the disease that by consider prescribing once daily medication to limit the use of protective equipment. You know, instead of or ordering medications four times a day, if the same medication is available once a day dosage or, a, you know, uh, long duration medication that would reduce the exposure. Use meter dose inhalers versus nebulizers to prevent aerosol spread of the viruses. And if you need, use a higher dose of meter dose inhalers such as bronchodilators rather than prescribing and nebulizers. Um, we also prefer that instead of giving patients insulin three to four times a day, if the blood sugars can be controlled with oral hypoglycemic, that would also reduce the degree of exposure. Consider um, thromboembolism prophylaxis with a single dose of Lovonox rather than twice a day dose of subcutaneous heparin. Infusion pumps, you know, which could be kept outside the ICU room so you do not need to go into the uh, patient's room frequently and you can adjust these things from outside. Even ventilators can be kept outside the patient's room to make the frequent changes without um, uh, without exposing yourself to COVID-19 patients. And a teamwork, what we refer to it as a buddy system, that when I'm inside the room with the patient, somebody is keeping watching and keeping a watch on me that I'm doing everything correctly what I'm supposed to. I'm wearing the protective gears properly. I'm not touching the things which I'm not supposed to. I'm done properly with the gloves and gowns and so on and so forth to protect each other from the spread of the disease. I hope I answered your question. Perfect. I think, Atul, in the interest of time, and it looks like we're right on time now, we're going to switch to Dr. Mukhopadhyay, who's going to look at things from a pathology perspective. Thank you so much, Atul. I'm going to ask, uh, if you don't mind, for 20 more minutes for you to stay on the line, sure. should there be a, a time for questions. So, Sanjay, thanks so much for joining. You were recently featured in a segment with the New York Times about COVID and acute respiratory distress syndrome. 
Can you please tell us about this segment and what ARDS is from a pathology perspective? Yes, thanks. Uh, thanks for having me, Dr. Himmerman. Uh, can you hear me? Is the audio okay? Perfect. Thank you. All right. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Mehta. I always learn something from every time you, you teach. And thank you, Joe, for, for having us on. Um, the New York Times segment actually came from um, Joshua Kessel, who is one of the producers at the New York Times, who reached out to me. This was, um, I think, about late March. And uh, he said, look, we need to um, explain to the general public what ARDS is, you know, what is going on in the lungs of the most severely affected um, patients with, with, um, uh, with COVID-19. And he said, we need to make it very simple and try to make something to explain to the general public. So together with Shubho Ghosh, who is an, um, a radiologist, thoracic radiologist at the Cleveland Clinic and another doctor from New York City, we tried to explain to the New York Times producers what ARDS is. And that's what the video was about. It's become uh, you know, very highly viewed. 1.3 million people have watched it. I would, I would recommend everyone to, have a, to, you know, to get a very simplified idea of what ARDS is. It's um, very helpful to watch this video. Next, please. So um, just to you know, explain to the general public and also to clinicians, doctors, why we have two different terms. Why do we call it ARDS and also diffuse alveolar damage? The simple answer is ARDS is a clinician's term. It's a term that, for example, Dr. Mehta would use in the clinic. So he would say, this patient has ARDS. But when a pathologist looks at pieces of tissue from these patients under the microscope, we cannot see ARDS. In other words, that's the, the criteria for ARDS are clinical, they are not pathologic. When a, when a pathologist looks at these tissues under the microscope, we see what's called diffuse alveolar damage, DAD. In other words, I cannot diagnose ARDS and Dr. Mehta cannot diagnose DAD. Next, please. Now, ARDS is actually defined by the following criteria. So first of all, it has to be acute. These patients that get sick with ARDS get sick generally within one week of the clinical insult or um, with new or, or worsening symptoms. The second thing that happens is the R in ARDS, that's respiratory distress. And this respiratory distress and respiratory failure is not explainable by heart failure. So once you have excluded heart failure or fluid overload, that's when you come to ARDS. The third component of ARDS is that oxygen levels have to be low. So you have to have severe hypoxia, and I'm not going to go into the numbers here, but the oxygen levels have, have to be very low. And finally, you have a compo component that deals with imaging findings, so chest X-ray or CT. And what you need to see on imaging of the chest is you need to see bilateral, both sides, lung opacities, meaning that the lung, which is normally black, should turn white. It has to have these fluffy sort of infiltrates, and they have to be on both sides of the lung. Next, please. So those are the components of ARDS. Now, this picture shows you a, an imaging study from ARDS on the left side versus an imaging study from a normal patient on the left side. And you can see the difference in a normal chest X-ray, you know, because the lungs are aerated, um, a normal, uh, you know, the lung should look black. That's the, you know, to hyper simplify things, the lung should look black. And you can see on the left with ARDS, the lungs look completely whited out. In fact, um, complete whiteout is supposed to be the classic uh, you know, radiologic uh, sign of ARDS. Next, please. What causes ARDS? It's important to remember now in the COVID, you know, it, it's become um, sort of popularized that, that the lay public now knows what ARDS is. But ARDS we've known for many, many, many years and is caused by many other things other than COVID. You know, shock, um, sepsis and, and infections of other kinds, uh, many other viral infections, um, you know, things like pneumocystis pneumonia, many other infections can cause ARDS. Toxic inhalants, one example I'll give you is vaping. So in, in people who vape THC, and if the THC is contaminated with vitamin E acetate, those, um, those examples of vaping can cause ARDS. So it's, it's very dangerous to um, inhale toxic inhalants, even things like mustard gases, war gases, phosgene, bleach, those, those kinds of things when inhaled can lead to ARDS. Toxic drugs, 
Chemotherapy is the classic one, you know, can cause ARDS, toxic ingestions. If you aspirate, for example, if your gastric acid goes back into your respiratory system for any reason, that can cause ARDS and ir irradiation. So there's a really, really long list of causes of ARDS. It's not just COVID. Next, please. Now here I wanted to show you just an, um, a sort of a Venn diagram of two overlapping entities. One is ARDS and one is COVID. And I, what, what I want people to take away from this is not, not all ARDS is COVID and not all COVID is ARDS. There's only an overlapping subset in the middle of people with COVID that get ARDS. So if you look at the circle on the right hand side, that's the circle that deals with all COVID patients. So on the right-hand side of the circle is patients with no symptoms, which is the majority of patients. And on the left-hand side of the circle is patients with symptoms. So even like, like Dr. Mehta mentioned, even with the patient with symptoms, only a subset of them develop ARDS. Now, if you look at the ARDS circle on the left-hand side, only a small subset of, of patients um, of ARDS develop, uh, you know, arise in the, in the setting of COVID. So that, that little sliver in the middle is the patients with COVID that develop ARDS. Next, please. Dr. Mukhapadia, we may uh, have a technical issue, but we'll try to run this video. Okay, let's do it. Let's try it. So this was an animation that was created by the, the Cleveland Clinic um, Animation Department. And here you see viral droplets attaching to the back of the nasopharynx, infecting the entire air passages and going downwards. And you can see as we branch, go left and right, these viral particles are entering down into the airways. So I, I think that did work, Joe, thank you. Now the next slide shows you, now this is also made by Mark Sabo from our animation department. The viral particles entering from the airways down into the alveoli. So these little air sacs are infected by these yellow viral particles. And as damage goes on with these viral particles, uh, these pink structures start to line the inside of the air sacs or the alveoli. And these pink structures are defined what we call diffuse alveolar damage. And what that pink material is made up of is plasma proteins that leak out from the little capillaries in the, in the lung and also debris from the damaged cells. So the mix of that creates these um, pink structures or hyaline membranes and that lines the inside of the alveoli, makes the air sacs thick. So if you imagine you're, in your mind, the air sacs normally should be thin like a little bubble that you would blow for your kids, you know, little soap bubbles. They are very, very thin and that enables gas exchange. And as diffuse alveolar damage progresses, those walls of the alveoli get thicker and oxygen can't go as easily into the bloodstream as, as normal. Next, please, Joe. Thank you for making that work. So on the um, pictures here, we see diffuse alveolar damage, which I've abbreviated here as DAD, as compared with a normal lung. So on the left-hand side, you have DAD, as you might see in a COVID patient with ARDS. And on the left-hand side is a completely normal lung. So if you look at the normal lung first and see where I've shown you with the arrows, that's what the wall of a normal air sac looks like. It's so thin that there's virtually no barrier or very little of a barrier for the oxygen to go into the little capillaries and in the red blood cells. So that's very good for breathing. Now, if you look at the left-hand side, you see diffuse alveolar damage and now look at the wall of the alveoli. It's very thick. It's, it's thickened by fibroblasts and other cells in the wall and also thickened by this pink lining on the inside, which is the hyaline membrane. So this is not good for breathing and that leads to um, the clinical picture of ARDS. The next slide shows you the late phase of diffuse alveolar damage and Dr. Mehta briefly referred to this as when he talked about complications from ARDS. So what happens is that as the DAD progresses in some patients, the wall of the alveolus gets thicker and thicker and your oxygen levels will fall deeper and deeper as that happens. Next, please. So that's so Sanjay, my uh, brief uh, summary of DAD. Sanjay, you recently co-authored the first report in the world of, of complete COVID-19 autopsies in the English language literature. What did you find? Yes, uh, thanks, Dr. Rimmerman. So uh, next slide, please, Joe. Um, I'm, I'm, I've shown you here the reference of this paper. This is by Lisa Barton et al. And what happened here is that uh, two autopsies that were performed in COVID patients um, in March, 2020, at the Oklahoma Office of the Chief Medical Examiner um, by Dr. Edena Stroberg and Dr. Eric Duval, who are forensic pathologists there. They came to my attention through Dr. Lisa Barton, who reached out to me and said, we need your help or expertise 
to look at the lung slides from these patients. So they had taken tissue from these decedents um, and they reached out to me. This paper at that time, there was no other complete autopsy published in the literature from anywhere in the world. So this became the first report of complete autopsies anywhere in the world in the English language literature. This was published, this is now published in the American Journal of Clinical Pathology. The paper came out April 10th. Uh, next, please. So this is a, an image of a chest radiograph that was taken post-mortem. So this is not the chest x-ray of the patient while he was alive. This was taken post-mortem. This was a 77-year-old elderly gentleman in Oklahoma who had developed fever and chills for six days and he was about to see his doctor the next week. He hadn't seen them yet. Uh, when his wife uh, noticed that he was getting very short of breath, was very weak, couldn't get up to go to the bathroom, and she noticed some gurgling sounds, immediately called 911. But unfortunately, on the way to the, to the hospital, the patient had a cardiac arrest. And in the hospital, barely survived for about 30 minutes and then unfortunately passed away. This patient had a history of hypertension and a remote splenectomy, so did have some underlying conditions. Um, importantly, I'd like to mention here, this, this gentleman was never tested for COVID, never treated, never put on a ventilator. So from this unfortunate you know, event, we get to see um, some, get some medical insight into the lungs of a person who was never ventilated. So it, the pathology that we see there is pure COVID-19 related pathology. Next slide, Joe. So what we saw in the lungs of this, this decedent who was actually tested for COVID post-mortem, so the forensic pathologist took a swab of the nasopharynx as well as swabs deep into the lung parenchyma and both came back positive for SARS-CoV-2. So we know this patient had, had COVID from the post-mortem testing. What we saw in the lungs was exactly what I described to you before, which was diffuse alveolar damage. The black arrows point to the hyaline membranes or these pink exudates that come out from leaky capillaries and from damaged cells. And the green arrows show you these blood vessels in the lung. And I want to show you that because in this case, we did not see the diffuse uh, blood clotting that's, that's described in some cases now. Um, so we did not see evidence of diffuse small microthrombi in the lungs in, in this case. Next, please, Joe. Um, I want to stress that DAD, like we see it here, is not uh, seen only in COVID patients. So on the left-hand side here, I'm showing you DAD from one of our COVID patients, um, the 77-year-old gentleman. But on the right-hand side, there's DAD from an H1N1 case. This was a case I had seen back in 2009 from an H1N1 or swine flu case. Those cases also showed DAD. So very similar pathology to what we're seeing now. Next, please, Joe. Here's a case of diffuse alveolar damage. The green al uh, arrows show you the identical hyaline membranes to what we're seeing nowadays in COVID, but this is not a COVID case. This is a case of disseminated strongyloidiasis. This is from a, pa uh, um, a patient who had a parasitic, a very serious parasitic infection. And on the right side of the screen, you see an arrow that shows you the actual parasite in the lung tissue. Next, please. Here's an example of a fungal infection um, that's actually common in Ohio and, and uh, uh, many parts of the United States called histoplasmosis. So in some cases of very uh, disseminated and severe histoplasmosis, you can get uh, diffuse alveolar damage there too. Next, please. Here is one setting that Dr. Mehta is very familiar with, which is lung transplant recipients. So it is not at all uncommon for lung transplant recipients to get diffuse alveolar damage in their lungs for a variety of reasons. And again, you see the hyaline membrane with the green arrow. On the right-hand side, you see diffuse alveolar damage you get with chemotherapy. This picture is taken from the lungs of a patient with lung cancer who had had chemotherapy prior to his resection of his lung cancer. And you, you can see a very thick alveolar septum uh, here too. Next, please. So DAD happens in a wide variety of cases. I briefly mentioned to you that patients with vaping can get DAD if they vape um, uh, marijuana, with, uh, which is contaminated with vitamin E acetate. Here's a picture of one of the cases we reported uh, last year, uh, again, in the American Journal of Clinical Pathology from patients who were vaping and got sick. So this is a case of a patient who was dabbing, that's a sort of variant of vaping, who was dabbing tetrahydrocannabinol or uh, marijuana. The active ingredient of marijuana also developed DAD. Next, please. Uh, another thing I'd like to mention from the autopsies we saw, Dr. Rimmerman, is that we saw inflammation. We saw very significant inflammation in the airways in these cases, and also inflammation in the lungs. 
And all the pictures that I'm showing, uh, especially the, the red circles, they show the little inflammatory cells, which happen to be lymphocytes. Next, please. The inflammation also affects the walls of the alveoli, so the alveolar septa. So there's an interstitial inflammation going on. And in the case we described, um, it actually involved, again, lymphocytes. So they appear to be a key cell uh, in, in COVID-19 lungs. Next, please. We actually did a couple of immunohistochemical stains to figure out what kind of cells they were. And to not to get too technical, but the cells are basically T lymphocytes, what we call T lymphocytes. And that's uh, shown by the CD3 cell uh, stain there. And uh, in our experience, the CD8, which is a subset of the T lymphocytes, is slightly higher than the CD4 cell. So we have some data on what kind of cells are actually present in the inflammatory infiltrate in the lung. Next, please. The case two in our study was actually much more complicated and a little more, in, um, uh, you know, sort of a variant. So this patient also had bilateral infiltrates in both lungs, but was a 42-year-old, so younger person with a history of myotonic dystrophy who, was, um, who did see a doctor and was, was labeled as community-acquired pneumonia. They, he was never tested for COVID-19, but post-mortem, a nasopharyngeal swab was positive. The lung swab was negative. So this was another case where the post-mortem swabs uh, diagnosed him with COVID-19. He also died after a few hours in the hospital. Next slide, please. So in contrast to the first case, we do not think that the cause of death in this patient was COVID-19. He definitely had COVID-19, but he died of what we think was acute bronchopneumonia due to aspiration. And we see, see this acute bronchopneumonia in his lungs under the microscope. And we know that he had aspirated food particles because we could, we could see those food particles in the microscope. So this is a sort of an outlier case where the patient definitely had COVID-19, but the cause of death was unrelated, probably unrelated, uh, related to an underlying condition and aspiration related to that. Next, please. Um, and finally, I would like to ad address this issue about blood clots. This is becoming more and more of an issue in, in COVID-19 patients. We know that there is, uh, Dr. Mehta also mentioned this, a coagulopathy. There's a recent paper just from a day or two ago from the New England Journal of Medicine that shows that uh, some of these patients have a high APTT level. So you think that they would bleed, but they ac actually are, don't have any clotting factor deficiencies. In fact, a large proportion of them, 91% of the ones that have high APTTs have a lupus anticoagulant, very, very surprising. Uh, 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 and that causes clotting, possibly is related to clotting. So here in these pictures, I am showing you blood clots in, within the small arteries in the lung. But interestingly, this is not a COVID-19 patient. This is a patient with H1N1 from 2009. And the point I want to make here is that clots actually happen not just in COVID-19, but in other cases that lead to diffuse alveolar damage in ARDS. So something for pe people to remember is uh, as we are hearing all this data about clots, you must remember that blood clots in the lung also occur in, in the setting of other diseases. It's not unique to COVID-19. Next, please, Joe. And next slide, please. Um, and I'm just showing you here some literature from textbooks from Dr. Kazenstein and from the Sp Spencer's pathology that make the same point that you can see thrombi or clots in small pulmonary arteries in other conditions that lead to diffuse alveolar damage. This is not just a COVID-19 thing. Next, please. So uh, your COVID ARDS segment is based upon findings from a retrospective study in Wuhan. Are you currently involved with any studies related to COVID and any respiratory findings? Yes, Dr. Remembrance, we are. Next, next, please, uh, Joe. So the Wuhan study was something that I touched on when, we was, when I was doing the um, initial video. This is a study of a lot of hospitalized patients, 191 patients. Next, Joe. And uh, I would like to um, direct your attention to this table. So of the 191 patients, 59 of these patients, or 31%, developed ARDS. And of those 59 patients that developed ARDS, 50 of those patients died. So 50 of 59 patients. So it was highly associated with mortality. There were only nine survivors. So the, the point of that um, uh, the reference to the Wuhan study was that ARDS is associated with increased risk of death in COVID-19. Next, please. Um, and to answer your question, uh, Dr. Rimmerman, yes, we are in, involved in several studies um, uh, related to COVID-19 now that we have tissue from these patients who unfortunately died. But the Oklahoma uh, forensic pathologists are playing a, a great role. Dr. Lisa Barton, Idina Stroberg, and Eric Duval are helping us with providing tissue 
to various researchers around the world to help in their research studies. Next, please, Joe. So we are helping Dr. Jisley Jenkins, who is an um, IPF physician and, and the editor-in-chief of Thorax uh, with studies on ACE2 expression in COVID-19 lungs. Next, please. We are collaborating with Dr. Anant Madhabhushi, who is um, a, an artificial intelligence and computational pathology researcher, very famous doctor in that field, who works just across the street from us at Case Western. So we are collaborating with him, providing him tissue to, for, for insights into whether computer vision or machine learning can give us some insights into COVID-19. Next slide. We are collaborating with Dr. Nima Sharifi, who is a top researcher at the Cleveland Clinic who works with in GU pathology and, and, and is an authority on androgens um, in prostate cancer. He's looking at whether there are any explanations as to why there are gender differences in COVID-19, why men and women are affected differently. So we are collaborating with him as well. Next, please. Oh, Sanjay, if you don't yeah. mind, we're running against time and I Absolutely. apologize for interrupting. Yeah, and this is the last one, and we are collaborating with also with Dr. Hatipoglu, and that's the last slide. Thanks so much. I want to squeeze in one or two questions, and Atul or Sanjay, feel free to uh, jump in. What do you think about acute fibrinous and organizing pneumonia reported by several groups in COVID-19? This pattern was already seen with SARS-CoV-1. Yes, I can take that question if you don't mind, Dr. Mehta. Please. Yes, so there, there, are, there are reports that's absolutely correct uh, of acute fibrinous and organizing pneumonia. I will point out that some authorities feel that this entity is actually a variant of diffuse alveolar damage. In some cases, these hyaline membranes that I showed you, they just fall into the air spaces and they create the appearance of a fibrinous pneumonia. So in some cases, it's a variant of diffuse alveolar damage. In other cases, it's a variant of organizing pneumonia. But the point is well taken. This is being reported more and more. Should, should we give anticoagulant prophylaxis to all COVID-19 patients? Dr. Mehta. Yes, the answer to that question is everyone should receive um, venous thromboembolism uh, prophylaxis uh, with once a day um, uh, Lovonox um, uh, subcutaneously. Uh, if they have evidence, only if they have evidence of the disease or the pulmonary embolism or pulmonary infarction, then they should be treated with therapeutic doses of heparin. And this is for hospitalized patients only, is that correct? This is for hospitalized patients only, correct. Okay. Uh, another question is, uh, and I'm not sure I understand the question, but hopefully you guys do. Did you test some IHQ for COVID-19? Yes, uh, I can, I can uh, tackle that. I think they mean immunohistochemistry. So Thank in you. our cases, we did not do immunohistochemistry, but subsequently, subsequent to the publication of that report, we have used chromogenic in situ hybridization in collaboration with another lab and the, our cases were positive. So there is evidence that there was actually viral particles inside those tissues. Two other quick questions and we'll have to sign off. Any role of corticosteroids in view of DAD inflammatory changes seen in the early stages? Um, we had, uh, there is a data of using this thing very early. I'm talking about when we started, when we had a surge in New York, my conversations with ICU physicians in New York they had used high doses of steroids, just like they use it in ARDS patients, but there is no scientific proof that high dose steroids, when they develop ARDS is making any difference in this group of patients. Do you recommend them as a last ditch effort? Um, it is, uh, I can understand it is so frustrating looking after some of these patients. And if the individual, as we say this thing in fibroproliferative phase of ARDS, yes, I would recommend use of um, corticosteroids. Okay, and the clogged endotracheal tubes, there have been several patients that need uh, the, their tubes changed out emergently. Is that a, a common finding or is that just a few case studies, please? Uh, well, so, go ahead, Dr. Matt. Starting that, yes. Yes, I can, I can address that. That is a yeah. few case studies. So Dr. Hatipoglu is actually working on this um, uh, on this occurrence that the endotracheal tube uh, get clogged and that it's difficult to extubate these patients. So this, this is not published data yet, but we have looked at the microscopic sections of these clots, and I think we'll be able to offer some insights soon in, the, in published form. And I promise, last question, uh, patients who are overweight or obese have, seem to have uh, more severe clinical disease with COVID and their outcomes are not as good. 
Uh, alveolar hypoventilation, restrictive lung disease, body habitus. What do you think, Atul? All of those things, diaphragmatic dysfunction, very low tidal volume, requiring high pressures, all of these things work. You know, these patients to begin with um, have microatelectasis and um, increased uh, AAO2 gradient to begin with. Many of these patients may even have obstructive sleep apnea. Many of them may even have central sleep apnea. And when they get bilateral pneumonias, I think the ventilatory management is a bit complicated. And maybe there is something else, obesity. And uh, if they are diabetic, you know, that also further adds to their immune system. And therefore, maybe combination of factors is playing in increased mortality in obese individuals. All right, well, thanks again. I'm gonna turn it back over to Joe Sweet for a conclusion, please. Thank you, Dr. Riverman. And thank you to all of our uh, registrants and viewers. Uh, this was, uh, to me, this was an extremely engaging and educational uh, presentation by our subject matter experts, Dr. Atul Mehta and Dr. Sanjay Mukhopadhyay. Uh, we also encourage you to complete our follow-up survey. We would love to hear from you as far as other topics of interest uh, for our future episodes. And thank you all for joining. Thank you to our presenters. And thank you, Dr. Rimmerman, for your excellent moderation. And we wish everyone a, a wonderful day. Thank you thank so you. much. Thank, thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.